much. And we now have Lou Brown talking about thriving with ADHD, which was mentioned in that talk. And I'd also like to say that the uh, the, the safety circle, whoops, there's a cable. The circle of safety was actually presented by, sorry, circle of security was presented by Moron at our New South Wales camp in a session. So that was something we're very familiar with as well. Yeah, it, it was really fa fabulous and uh, something I wish I'd seen, um, you know, when my children were much younger. So I'll just get you set up. Are you ready to go for the live streaming? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lou Brown. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm Lou Brown. Um, I have to admit that I don't know a lot about Tourette syndrome, so I was asked to come here because I know a lot about ADHD. I have ADHD, and so does my son, and I'm an ADHD coach, consultant, and advocate as well, so it's something I live and breathe every day. Um, I was expecting that... Um, Dr De Silva would actually talk to you a little bit more about ADHD, so I wasn't going to give you lots of information exactly about what it was, because I thought it would have already been covered, and go more on about how to support and advocate for our kids. And the whole idea is we want them to thrive. And the reason that I called my website and blog and things Thriving with ADHD is that when my son was diagnosed and then I was diagnosed, I got really quite devastated. I was really frightened of his diagnosis because I'd had quite a hard upbringing and I had not felt very good about myself for a very long time. And I was really scared that he would have my old life. And then I became determined that that was not going to happen and it wasn't going to be good enough for me that my son was just going to have, you know, a life and he's going to have all these troubles and he was going to survive. My desire for him is that he will thrive. And I thoroughly believe that that's what, you know, kids and adults with ADHD and Tourette syndrome can do. We just have to work out how to do it our way. So um, ADHD is a neurobiological disorder and it's characterised by um, some traits of having inattentive characteristics as well as impulsive hyperactive characteristics as well. So those symptoms, although everybody can have them, actually manifest in ways that become quite severe and start to impede all aspects of your life. So when someone's inattentive, you're usually described as somebody that, you know, might be a bit daydreamy, off with the fairies, struggling to concentrate and focus, etc. When someone's, like, impulsive and hyperactive, they tend to get described like they're a little bit like a race car, zooming around everywhere, you know, a million miles an hour, but their brakes don't work very well, so they crash. And then you get other individuals and children who have combined ADHD, so they have both those traits. But as you would know, when someone has Tourette syndrome, they prevent with much more than just tics as their challenges. And that is the same with ADHD. Those inattentive, hyperactive, impulsive symptoms are really only the tip of the iceberg. And although they can be challenging, we all really need to remember that they actually are beyond the control and not of the making of the person who has the disorder. They stem from genetic differences that result in alterations in brain development, structure, conductivity and function. And when it comes to ADHD, these neurological differences affect a child's executive functions. So your executive functions are basically the mental processes one uses to regulate and control their thoughts, words, actions and emotions. They also help you to perceive and sense time and kind of give you an idea so you can kind of gauge your behaviour across time in order to achieve your goals and maintain your social standing. So for an example, your executive functions help you to concentrate and pay attention, to consider the consequences before responding to a situation, to plan and prioritise, to self-motivate and to effortlessly adjust and direct your attention and behaviour. And they enable you to successfully navigate social situations and to moderate your emotions. 
And we know children who have ADHD, they develop these executive function abilities about 30% behind their peers. And as they develop and get older, they tend to only develop about 70 to 75% of the executive function capacity of their peers and always remain delayed. And as you can see from this slide, this deficit can be quite... Um, huge. So when you think about, you know, a child is 14, they're in high school, yet they have a, an executive function capacity of a 9.8 year old. The other thing to remember is that the ADHD brain is interest wired. And the reason for this is that interest increases dopamine. So there's lots of reasons, well, not lots, but there are some considerable reasons that the research is starting to indicate why people have ADHD. And one of them is it appears that we have lower levels of dopamine in our nerve synapses. And what the dopamine does is it gets the electrical impulse from one nerve, it carries it across the synapse to the next nerve, which, so the impulse goes across that nerve and it carries across the synapse again to the next nerve, etc. So it's like a messenger that picks up the electrical impulse and carries it across. And I know it's really abstract, but every time you think something, it's just electrical impulses going back and forwards. So if you have low levels of dopamine in the nerve synapse, sometimes it could be like those electrical impulses aren't getting through. So what we know is that interest increases dopamine. So ADHD is not a disorder of not being able to focus and regulate, it's being able to not do it you know, just at will. So when you're in your natural state and you're trying to do something that's boring or tedious, the dopamine levels are low and it's like those impulses can't get through and you can't use those um, abilities to focus, etc. But all of a sudden, you're doing something that you're really interested in, the dopamine levels rise, and then you're engaged and you start to hyper-focus on what you're doing. But what happens is then you can start to have struggle or disengaging and transferring um, away from what you're doing to back to something else, especially if someone asks you to do something that's tedious. So for an example, you might see a child that's playing with their Lego on the floor. You'll go, hey, mate, come to the dinner table. It's time for tea. They say, yep and they don't move. And the reason they don't move is because the executive function capacities or the, the abilities that other people use to go to themselves, you know, self-soothe, it's going to be okay, I can come back to my Lego, it's going to stay here, mum will get really upset with me if I don't move. Um, you know, they're not getting images that are saying that, you know, my mum is going to be upset if I don't move from this place. They can't direct their attention, everything. They're stuck here and they're getting dopamine from what they're doing. And then we go along and we take the toy away and they have an emotional reaction. And we basically caused it because we've seven, severed that dopamine. They're stuck here and we've pulled it away in a drastic way. So that's what's going on for these children. So we have to work out how do we trans you know, get them to transition away from it in a way that's not doing harm or upsetting them. The other thing when it comes to interest is that having dopamine in your brain feels really good. And that means that if you have ADHD traits, you're always going to be trying to find um, dopamine. And it's like you actually don't have a choice. And if you can't find dopamine in healthy ways, you will get it in unhealthy ways. So sometimes if you have a child with ADHD and they're really bored, they're more likely to participate in risky behaviour, more likely to act out, to provoke even yourself in order to get a reaction because that will increase dopamine. And I've met adults with ADHD who have to participate in extreme sports to make sure they get enough dopamine so they're not gambling or drinking or driving erratically etc as one way of getting um, or managing their disorder. So how do we proactively parent our kids and best support them so they actually can thrive? Well we do this first by really understanding their disorder. So we want to understand Tourette syndrome really really well as well as ADHD and understand how those um, differences actually show up in their child's life. And the reason for this is the reasons we attribute to a child's challenging behaviour greatly influences how we perceive them as well as how we respond to them. Then we really need to understand the why behind the behaviour as this helps us to make better informed decisions as to whether we actually need to adjust our expectations so they align with our child's executive function age rather their chronological age or we need to put in place scaffolding that helps our kids bridge the gap between their executive function age and the chronological age in order for them to be successful. And if we don't do that, they are going to fail. We also, having understanding, you know, their Tourette syndrome and their ADHD, it becomes very clear that disciplining them 
will not rectify any of their challenges. Instead, if we just punish them, what we're going to do is actually punish them for symptoms of their disorder, which will actually result in crushing their self-esteem and self-worth, foster shame and exacerbates their challenges, and also can contribute to them becoming more oppositional and defiant and to developing anxiety, depression, eating disorders and drug and alcohol use and other de de um, quite devastating outcomes. So what's scaffolding? It's basically tools and strategies that we put in place in order to support our children's lagging self-regulatory skills. And to accurately identify those skills and what they need in the moment, we basically need to understand what's going on for them. And I'm going to give you an example. So let's take one of the executive functions is actually inhibition or self-restraint. And why we have to be able to inhibit ourselves is if we don't, what we do is we just respond straight away for something and we have either an instinctual or a habitual response. Now, sometimes an instinctual response is really appropriate. So if you see a bear, you don't want to go, oh, wow, there's a bear, where did he come from? Has he got any family? You need to fight or flee. But there's times if you have an instinctual response, say your boss or if you're a child, your teacher's giving you some constructive feedback and then you arc up or you run away, that instinctual response is inappropriate. Same with habits. Some habits are really important. So we have the habit, say, of cleaning our teeth, etc. When we have a habit, it means we're using less brain power and we're getting things done to keep ourselves safe. However, if our habit is to reach for food or alcohol when we're actually struggling or to jump from here to catastrophe in 2.5 seconds in our head, that habit becomes a problem. So when you can inhibit yourself, it gives you a chance to make a willful decision. And you do that by pausing, thinking and responding. So the process of inhibition is actually quite complex. So when someone inhibits themselves, the first thing they do is they have to pause. They turn their attention inwards and you start contemplating the future. And when you do this, you do this in what's conceptualised as being this working memory space. And you have these really great filters when you're neurotypical that when you're thinking in this working um, memory space, you can filter out all distractions that are internal and filter out ex internal distractions so you can stay on track. You also get information that helps you kind of work out what would be the best way to respond. So you get ideas. So maybe you go, you know, when I did this this last time, this happened. Or when I did this, this happened. Or I read this story and they recommended this and this happened. You might create some new ideas, do a cost-weight analysis, and you'd action your response. And when you're neurotypical, this happens in two point, you know, in a second, less than a second, and you don't even realise you're doing it. But this process is fraught with problems when you have ADHD. For example, most of us, the more in a sorry, the more hyperactive, impulsive we are, we kind of like wired for thought action, thought words coming out of our mouth. There's no actual stopgap there. And it wouldn't matter, because I'm quite aware of my own ADHD, that no matter what I do, whether I um, do meditation or uh, I try to write, you know, um, set alarms, whatever I do, when on my natural search, when something happens, there is no stopgap there. In fact, when I first took medication, I said to my partner, what is that? It was like this space. It was 47 years old. What is that? There's this space where I can stop and think for the first time in my life. It wasn't there naturally. Okay, then we have to turn our attention inwards and start contemplating the future in this working memory space. The problem when you have ADHD is that your filters don't work very well. So instead of being able to screen out all this interruption, everything has started vying for your attention and you also get interrupted by internal thoughts that are relevant to what you're doing. We can also have working memory problems and not get the information we need as well as planning and problem solving problems. But by knowing this, by knowing our children are like wired as if like there is no stopgap, it gives us information that helps us work out how to scaffold or support them. So we set them up for um, success. So it doesn't matter. This is what um, uh, Russell Barclay would say. Is ADHD is not about not knowing what to do. It's not being able to access what you know in the moment. So we might teach kids with ADHD how to pause, all these strategies and things, but that does not mean in the moment that they can do it. It doesn't mean we don't want to teach them and over time hopefully those um, things will strengthen and grow. But to teach a child with ADHD a strategy and expect that they can just do it 
even as an adult, when I can't always do it myself, is just fighting against their neurology. So as a parent, we need to put in place strategies that help them to pause, etc. So for example, the first strategy actually, probably for most people with um, ADHD is medication. Now, I'm not pro-medication. I'm pro that we help our kids develop in a healthy manner and that we help them achieve their full attempt to potential. And they do that in a way that they feel good about themselves and good about their future. And the fact is that medication helps somebody pause when they have ADHD if it works for them more successfully than any other intervention does. It doesn't mean the kids will know how to, you know, what to do when they've paused and how to think through things. And when you're really excited or really anxious, the medication sometimes doesn't work either. Next, we can put in strategies in place to help them pause. For example, we could say, I'm going to ask you a question, but I'm going to walk away and come back in five minutes to hear the answer. So you give them a chance for them not to answer in two seconds. So say they, you know, they, you ask them, did you take that chocolate biscuit? And they go, no, it wasn't me, because as soon as you ask them, it comes straight out of their mouth what's in their head. They've talked to you and said you the answer before they've had time for their working memory to give them the information. So they might say, you know, it wasn't me. And then they walk away and two seconds later, they're going, oh my gosh, it was me. And they come and tell you and you tell them off. They're never going to want to come and tell you again. But they didn't lie on purpose. So we put the stop gap in there by saying, I'll ask you a question, I'll come back and get it. Or you can have a rule that's like, the 30 second or 60 second rule. So if you say something to me and I, you know, you're going to change your mind, I'm not going to tell you off. I understand your brain. Didn't give you the information straight away, but thank you very much for telling me now what's actually going on. You can also ask them to repeat instructions back to you because that can help them pause, think about what you've actually asked and process that information so they don't miss it. You can ask them questions about decisions that they're going to make and discuss the pros and cons with them to help them pause. And you can... Um, also, don't argue with them. If you have wired for action, thought words coming out of your mouth, and you argue with the child that's like that, you are going to make them oppositional and defiant and encourage them to argue and create that habit. We need to be the stopgap for them and stop that pause. We also need to learn to listen with empathy, which we're going to discuss later, as because when we listen with empathy, we open up what's called teachable moments, and then we can talk to them about what might help them pause, because it's more important that they're on board. And we also need to be really patient with them. And sometimes, whatever you do, nothing works, especially when medication wears off. And I'll give you an example. One year on Mother's Day, we decided that we were going to go to stay in um, a B&B and my son had made a Mother's Day present for me at, at school. He put it in this box and bought some um, chocolates and things with my partner and we took it away with us. You know, about once an hour, maybe once every two hours at the start of the day, Jack was saying to me, oh, I can't wait for Mother's Day to mother, I can't wait to give you my present. So, That's really cool, Matt, I can see you're really excited, I can't wait either. That night, by the time the medication wore off, Every five minutes, Jack was saying, oh, Mum, I can't wait for Mother's Day tomorrow. Can you please make Mother's Day now? And he was desperate. And all I could say to him was, I know, mate, it's really hard, isn't it, when we want something to happen, you can feel... Because I know what that feeling's like. You know, it feels like you want it now. I can't make it Mother's Day, but we can pretend it is and things, but I can't actually make it Mother's Day. And then he'd say to me, oh, it's OK, Mum, we can wait for tomorrow. Five minutes later, he'd be back again. But if I told him off for that... Even though it was frustrating and it went on forever, I would be telling him off as something that he could not control. He, I know the feeling of what it feels like to have it bursting inside of you and you can't get it out. So by listening with empathy and be kind to him, I protected our relationship, made him feel good and got him through the night until the next morning. So sometimes we have to put that stopgap in for them and just keep going and, and weathering it out even though when it's hard. The next part of proactive parenting involves loving and accepting them for who they are, not trying to necessarily always change them or wishing that they were something else. And the most important thing is to choose your relationship with your child above anything else. That's our family rule in our house. Nothing else matters over that. The next is to foster in them self-awareness, self-acceptance and self-compassion, which we'll talk about. Harness their strengths and inwards. Um, interests and to gently teach and collaborate with them so they start to learn the knowledge and skills that they'll need to one day independently manage their ADHD and thrive. 
Now, I have this theory. When you are neurotypical, say this is the executive um, function capacity of the average neurotypical person. Now, I know nobody fits directly into this timeline, but just as an average, that's where you sit. When you have ADHD, you tend to develop about 75% of that um, executive function capacity. Now, sometimes you may have that ability, but may not have fully developed that, that, you know, that capacity. And as Wei Chen um, mentioned, sometimes when you've got ADHD, you're not paying attention. You don't pick up on things that would actually strengthen that capacity. And as an example, when I was 47 years old, I started looking into things to help my son with social skills and things, and I came along um, a table that talked about the levels of friendship. Before that, all I knew is that I overshared, could never stop, could never work out why it was necessarily a problem, what the rule is, knew that it just was a problem sometimes, but had nothing guiding me inside internally of what rules to use to, to do that because I never learned implicitly because I was too busy chasing rainbows and off with the fairies and running a million miles an hour. I presented very much like a boy when I was a child. So learning that information enabled me to strength my executive, strengthen my executive function capacity. Then we start putting in, in place tools and strategy to help bridge the gap. And those tools and strategies can be medication, making things visible, because to me, if something is not visible, it just doesn't exist, etc. And we're trying to bridge the gap. But the truth of the matter is that when you have a neurological disorder, most of us will never be neurotypical no matter how we try. And if the end game is being neurotypical and trying to do what everybody else does, we will beat ourselves up constantly and we can never feel good about ourselves. And if you don't allow yourself to be you and you're trying to be something else, you can never be happy. You need to be able to be your authentic self. So it's really important that we foster self-compassion in our children with ADHD. And self-compassion looks like being able to accept yourself for who you are and know what your strengths are and to use them. And it means understanding that even I'm going to do everything I can to be successful, if I fall, I need to be able to catch myself. I need to be able to go, are you okay? What do you need right now to be all right before I go and fix it? Because if we don't, we end up getting depression, anxiety and everything else, trying to be something that we're not. So we need to find that happy place. And it is possible to thrive in that place. It's not possible to thrive if you're trying to be something that you can't be. Sorry, my medication gives me a very dry mouth. <laughs> Okay, so everything starts and ends with your relationship you have with your child. So having a very healthy relationship with a child is vital because if they feel heard, valued, understood and appreciated for who they are rather than they have to be something else, they're more likely to act in a way that meets your expectations as well as societal expectations as they want to protect the relationship that you have with them. They're also more likely to be receptive to redirection, education and support intervention, as well as to gaining awareness and understanding of their disorder so they can move towards self-acceptance um, and developing self-compassion. So one of the ways to develop this is to use what I call the five C's framework of parenting, which involves connection, composure, compassion, collaboration and consistency. So connection involves focusing on your relationship with your child first, spending one-on-one -on -one time with them doing things that they love. One-on-one -on -one time is not talking to them while they're doing the dishes. One-on-one -on -one time is getting on the floor and playing with them the games that they want to play with, letting them lead, so they actually, you have actually walked into their space. So they feel that, they, that you are or care about them enough that you will stop doing whatever you're doing and enter their realm. It's making them feel safe and valued, having fun together, giving them your full attention and letting you know them know you love them. It's focusing on the positive, showing respect, appreciation, honouring their boundaries and keeping them company when you know they're having trouble doing things that are taxing their executive functions and supporting them cope and deal with their emotions. Composure involves being patient with your child and managing your own emotions. 
It's breathing before responding and reminding yourself that the challenging behaviour that they may be presenting is due to lagging skills or an underlying, you know, um, challenge that, you know, that's going on in their brain rather than willful disobedience. And it's giving directions in a calm, matter-of-fact manner, describing, not judging, and being a good role model. And if we want our kids to learn how to self-regulate when it comes to their emotions, and we're not role modelling that in return, what hope do they have? That's really unfair, so it all starts with us. Compassion involves understanding and accepting our children's disorders and ensuring they receive the treatment and support they require. And when they're struggling, it's about getting curious, donning the detective hat, and trying to figure out what could be contributing to their challenges. To do this, you can ask yourself questions like, you know, is it my child's lagging skills that are contributing to this behaviour? Such as, is there a problem here with self-awareness? Do they need engagement or stimulation? Is there a build-up of extra energy that's going on and they require a movement break? Is my child trying to communicate something with me through their behaviour? Are they really anxious or scared or worried or overexcited, etc.? Is there an unmet functional need that may contributing to their behaviour? For example, are they feeling insecure? Are they feeling really anxious or hungry or boredom or frustrated? And boredom is like a killer when you have ADHD. Um, are there any environmental use that, issues that could be contributing to this behaviour? And is there a pattern? And once you've worked out what's going on for your child, then you can use this information to anticipate their challenges and put in place strategies to either mitigate or support their lagging skills. So they can learn from you through guided practice and supported interventions, as well as start to develop their own awareness and ability to manage this, their challenges themselves. And one important thing that comes into here is listening with empathy, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Collaboration involves starting to use the teachable moments that open up when you actually listen to a child with empathy and with compassion and using them in a place, time or like using kind of a coach approach to actually get them involved, to foster their strength and to ask them, what do you think might help here in this situation? So you're starting to build their own awareness and their own ability to um, make decisions about how to best respond and manage themselves. If we don't collaborate with our kids and start doing it when they're young, when they get to be teenagers, they will tell us where to go and then it's too late. So if we want them to understand and participate, we need very early on for them to start understanding the disorder and starting to include them in the management of it so they can start taking on their skills and start taking not full responsibility but at least buy-in. So then they're more likely to stay with us and, you know, to not rebel later. Um, collaboration also means, you know, giving them a choice, involving them in any rule setting and decision making, exploring options with them, staying open to possibilities, giving lots and lots of praise and knowledge and with rewards, etc. And the whole idea is to gradually reduce the need for external imposed discipline by fostering internally imposed discipline and self-regulation, which takes a very, very long time when a child has ADHD. And then it's doing all these things consistently. It involves setting and, and reflecting rules and expectations, making very clear requests making sure that we, you know, they understand all the steps involved, that we are kind of predictable in our response, um, and that we focus on outcomes and praise them from the things. Now, we do need to have um, set clear and fair um, kind of expectations on our children that fit onto their executive function capacity, and we need to have some consequences, but that's very different to punishment. Now, listening with empathy, I think, is the most important skill that somebody who has a child with a difference, such as Tourette's or ADHD, needs. Listening with empathy is a way to help children settle when they're emotionally dysregulated. It fosters self-awareness and self-acceptance, as well as self-compassion in our children. It opens up teachable moments and it helps to build problem-solving skills. So, Supporting kids when they're emotionally dysregulated is really, really important because what happens is when they get emotionally dysregulated, cortisol or the stress hormone starts surging through their body and it activates the fight or flight response. And when you're in that response, you kind of get, you know, 
um, your heart rate starts to increase and your breathing increases, you get um, blood going to your muscles so they tense up and so you could actually, you know, run away, etc. You pimple pupils. And at the same time, the blood gets diverted away from your non-vital organs. And your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain where your executive functions are, are considered non-vital in that arena because they need to fight or flight, not to think, 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 think things through. So when a kid is actually elevated, they actually do not have the ability to calm themselves down, to think rationally, to listen and take on what you're saying and things. In fact, when you keep talking to them and asking them in that situation, you're probably going to escalate them more. So by listening with empathy, we help them to calm down. And once they're calm, then we can start collaboratively speaking to them and getting them to understand what's going on and work out ways to support them and try and hopefully prevent, you know, the challenging behaviour happening again. So listening with empathy um, is basically listening with the intention of understanding their experience and point of view. Um, what else do I need? It helps kids feel loved, understood and valued, makes you, them feel secure in their relationship with you. So if they know that they're really struggling and you're still patiently standing beside them, helping them, that you really love them, you're really there for them um, and you've got their back. It's also very protective as when you listen with self-compassion, with compassion to them or with empathy, you're actually fostering self-compassion in themselves. The one thing that we really need is absolutely vital. So how do we listen with empathy? We do that by pausing and listening with the aim of understanding their point of view, by listening to what they're saying as well as how they're saying it, by acknowledging and validating their feelings while reversing judgment and avoiding giving advice. And yes, we can listen to the empathy without condoning behaviour. When we're listening with empathy, we need to ensure that our posture is open and non say the word now, intimidating, and we use body language and gestures that signal to the child that we're really interested in what they have to say. And we assure that our language makes them feel safe and heard and encourages them to open up. So, for example, phrases such as, I can see you're really upset right now. Gee, that must seem really unfair. You're really excited, aren't you? Now, that must be really, really hard. I can see how that would be challenging. So what you're saying is da-da-da-da-da. Let me make sure I understand. Really can help them feel heard. Now, I've <laughs> roped two lovely ladies in to read a role play for you that gives you an example of what listening with empathy looks like. <laughs> so nine-year-old Sam slams down his iPod in frustration and starts banging his fist aggressively on the couch while cursing out loud. His outburst burst breaks the calm mood of the house and triggers many feelings in his mum, Julie. These feelings stem from annoyance. Julie was happily de daydreaming while making her dinner before she was interrupted by Sam. She's annoyed by the interruption and by the fact she has to drag herself away from her planned routine to attend to him yet again. And that, as a result, she'll probably not get her chores done in time to watch her favourite TV program tonight. Concern. Julie's really worried about Sam. She's concerned that if he doesn't learn how to control his emotions, it will lead to negative consequences for him later in life. There have been a few issues at school recently. And frustration. Julie's aware that Sam seems to be having more and more difficulties managing his emotions. If the trigger isn't losing a game on his iPod, it's something else. She can't help thinking, why can't he just grow out of it? Thankfully, Mum has learned that it's never a good time to deal with Sam's behaviour when she's triggered. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> so instead, she gives him gives into the urge to control Sam's anger. She stops, closes her eyes, takes a deep breath to settle herself. She also reminds herself the reason Sam gets so frustrated and has difficulty managing his emotions is because he has ADHD. Emotional dysregulation is part of the disorder. Sam's reaction isn't personal. He's not trying to upset her or to manipulate her. Sam's outburst is because he cannot cope with his intense feelings, so her role is to help him to calm down and to teach him how to cope with his emotions. 
and if she doesn't keep her cool and respond calmly when she is triggered, how on earth can she expect him to learn how to? Now mum's ready to approach Sam from a place of empathy and understanding. Sam, I can see that you're really upset. I am. Life sucks. Really bad, hey? Oh, the worst. Oh, gosh. You must feel awful. Yep, I do. Is something really bothering you? Yes, life's so unfair. Mm. Life can feel like that sometimes. Like today. It feels like that today. I'm sorry you're really struggling today. What happened? Well, you all just think I'm silly. I promise I won't. Why don't you try me? Promise? Promise. Well, I've been trying to collect all these coins in the game so that I can go up a level and it's taken me days and I nearly had enough and then I just lost them all. It's not fair. Wow, that must have been really frustrating for you. Yes, it was. I hate it when this happens. Yeah, I bet. We all feel like that when we try our hardest and something goes wrong. It's really annoying. It sure is. I am so cross and now my iPod's going to turn off because it's nearly dinner time and I hate that you make me turn it off. I can imagine that knowing your iPod is going to turn off soon must add to your disappointment. It does. And now I'm never going to be able to get enough coins to go up a level. All the other kids at school are already up to level 10 and I'm only at level 7. Oh, mate. No wonder you're upset. You want to be at the same level as your friends. I do. It's just not fair. I'm sorry this is so hard. I wish I could do something to get all your coins back. But you can't. I know. Mum moves closer to hug Sam. She waits patiently for him to settle. Sam, I really understand why you were upset. It's okay to be mad, but I need you to know it's never okay to slam your iPod down. It could get broken. I know, Mum. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. I know it's hard. Those big feelings can feel very overwhelming. What do you think you could do next time you're feeling frustrated? Well, I could... Notice how Mum gave Sam her full attention and listened without judgement and without giving advice. She simply reflected back to Sam what he was saying to validate his feelings. Eventually Sam started to settle because he felt heard and understood. Her response then opened up a teachable moment that Sam was happy to discuss what he could do next time he felt frustrated. It may take a long time and constant repetition for Sam to learn how to handle his frustrations. But however, now he's well on his way, thanks to his mum. And note that sometimes it's better not to talk to the child straight away about the issue, such as throwing the iPod down. Sometimes we need to wait for another time. It might be the next day when they're settled before we can bring up you know, that information or that discussion, or it might be when they've got medication on board next. Okay. So what else can we do? It's really important with our kids that we learn to teach and not tell and to avoid lectures. As soon as we start giving lectures or highlighting exactly what's going wrong, all we do is trigger the fight or flight response and they're not listening. The best thing we can do is try to teach them in indirect ways. So we're teaching them things without even knowing that we're doing, it, doing so. To use really simple language, and it might be like you get habits in your house where you just say things like manners, no-go zone try again, rephrase it. So you're giving directions to them that aren't too complicated and don't have, you know, um, a lecture behind them. There needs to be, though, those no-go zones, like delivery, lying, swearing, hurting others, etc. Then we can use um, language that fosters self-awareness. For example, many children with ADHD struggle to regulate their emotions. And the first step in learning how to deal with one's emotions involves identifying them to start with. So a way of helping indirectly, and I know someone mentioned it before, was using things like the rule of, um, the zones of regulation by Lee Creepers. So what you can do as a mum or a dad, you can go, oh my God, I'm so tired right now, I'm in the blue zone. What zone are you in, mate? And starting to help them to stop 
and check in. But you use yourself first as the person that the attention goes to, not them. So you don't just go to them when they're, you know, in the yellow zone, overexcited. What zone are you in now? Because you're drawing attention to them as if there's something wrong. These kids, you know, there's some, there's an expert who thinks that kids with ADHD receive, you know, 20,000 more negative comments about themselves before the age of 12 than any other kids. So the only way we can combat that is not going straight to the source when something's on and trying to, you know, navigate around it. So for an example, say um, if I wanted to, you know, teach my son about, you know, how it feels when you're upset. I might say to him when I'm really upset, oh, gosh mate, I feel so upset right now and when I get really upset I feel all jittery inside and I can feel like my face getting all red and I'm feeling really, really tense and, and sometimes when, you know, it gets really bad I can get a lump in my throat and stuff. Does that happen to you? So I'm kind of giving him information of what that looks like and then he will check in with himself. Or I might say in the moment, but it's not directed at him. Or I might say, to, did you see that person in the shopping centre, they did this, this and this. How would you feel if you were on the other end of that as well? What would you do, da da da? So he's not the focal point. So he's not closing down and going into the fight or flight response. He's open. They're especially open if you share with them that you're struggling because they care about you and want to help and they're listening and it keeps them open and engaged. We also want to use language that, you know, builds engagement. Um, as Dr. Wei Chen said, that kids with ADHD don't necessarily learn implicitly because we're too busy being distracted and everything else to necessarily focus and pay attention. So we don't always pick on, up on things. And this includes, like, say, how important our relationship is. So I know that when I, you know, first got my son to start doing the dishwasher, and we still have conversations now, getting him to do it wasn't a lecture about you have to do the dishwasher, I'm going to give you a, you know, a tick on this thing or a reward. It was about... Wow, I love it when we actually work as a team together. It's so important, isn't it, that we you know that we help each other out. And when you do the dishwasher with me, I feel like you know you really value me as well. And da 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 da. And so now there's this buy-in, and my son implicitly knows that the conversation around how important our relationship is, how much I love him, is so there in concrete that all I have to say is, "Hey, mate, we went to the dishwasher for me." I might get a, "Oh, do I really have to?" but he will still do it without much else, other problems because it's engaged in that implicit understanding of what's important. So we do need to be really explicit in the information. They don't just pick up on that it's part of teamwork, that it's part of this, that it's part of that. They don't pick up on so very much. And sometimes what they're not picking up on, even if you try to explain to them, they can't even get yet. So we kind of have to keep them safe and lead them in that direction. We can also use language that promotes memory and problem-solving skills, such as, what do you think? Do you remember what happened? Can you tell me that story? Wow, we've got a problem. What do you think a good solution is? What do you think might help you? What are some alternative solutions? And what are the most important things to remember? And sometimes if they don't want to engage with us, we can just say to them, you know, I'd be happy to brain school ideas with you. And if they turn around and say, no, nah, I don't want to, you go, yep, yeah, sure, but just know that I'm here next time. And so say maybe something happens and they're struggling, you listen with empathy. You ask them, you know, after when they've settled down, is, you know, what do you think might help? And they can't think of anything, you offer to brainstorm. You stop pushing, okay? The next time they come back, the same thing happens. You listen with empathy. You offer to brainstorm, they say no, you stop pushing. Eventually, when you listen with empathy and you make that offer, they will actually say to you, OK, I think maybe I do need a hand. Or they might come and ask you. But if you push and push and push, they're not going to because they feel judged and, you know, etc. But the offer's there and they feel safe and they will one day come to you and ask you. The other thing is kids with ADHD need so much praise that you need to saturate with them saturate them. So you might think, you know, um, look at it this way, it's like praise is like this thing that slips off the fry pan when there's Teflon on it, where negative situations, they just stick like glue. So we literally have to saturate our kids with praise and you see them like their chest poke up and things and that's much more important than giving them other rewards. So when kids are really young, you can use tick charts and things, but as they get older, they'll basically turn around to you one day and say, well, I'll do that for you if you do this for me. It's not about that. It's about everything. It's like if you have a good relationship and you're making them feel good about themselves and they can see how much you love them and value them, they're going to want to do it anyway. That is the reward, being praised and appreciated and valued. 
We also want to harness the power of interest. So like I said before, interest increases dopamine, all right? So if we can make things interesting, if we can inject urgency or humour or fun or creativity or competition into things, it's much more likely that they're going to get things done. And I remember when my son was really um, young, to get dressed in the morning, we used to take our clothes into the lounge room, we'd play one song, if we got dressed on time before that, we'd dance around together in celebration. Things became a game. If we wanted to pick up his things, like the, like the Lego sprawled on the, um, the floor in the lounge room, it would be, okay, let's see how many blocks we can pick up that's red first, and then maybe it'll be blue ones, or then we'll do something else and come back to it and make it fun, and then he's engaged and involved in doing so. We also need to help them when they're bored. <laughs> Let me tell you, when you have ADHD, boredom is excruciating and it's actually debilitating. There is no point saying to a child with ADHD when they're bored, come on mate, you've got so many other toys and so many this and this and this to go and do it. They do not have the ability to actually regulate and get out of where they are. There's no dopamine there when you're bored. You actually have to go and do it with them. You know, and sometimes if we don't want them to hit their siblings and to muck up and do this, we need to make sure they don't get bored, which means sometimes we need to get off our butts and go play with them or arrange things to keep them occupied or a friend aid or whatever. But leaving them in a state of boredom is actually asking for problems. Okay? And it takes a lot. You get bored really quickly when you've got ADHD, but you're asking for challenges if we leave them in that, situa in that state and don't get involved. The other thing is that when you spend time playing with them, they feel loved and validated. It's that bringing that collection, that um, connection together, so they're more likely to, you know, open up to you and to behave in the way that you want to. And I have to say that even like my son's ten now, and I'm still outside playing handball every day, or sitting at the dining room table drawing and participating in art and learning how to paint, which I've never been an artist in my whole life, because he loves it, because that fosters connection and helps him want to be the best version of himself, and. When things go wrong at school or something happens, he knows that I'm his safe haven because I've proven it over and over again. And there is nothing more protective than that. And like Dr Wei Chen said, it's like you have all these things fighting against the child and you're trying to push up. That barrier that you put in place to prevent it or protect it, part of that is your relationship with them. It keeps them safe. And growing up, I didn't have that and I had a really hard time. And the difference between people who have quite significant ADHD that I do and the people who feel good about themselves is often their parents and how much their parents love them, how they treated them, how they made them feel. Rather than making them feel bad about themselves, they loved them and fostered them regardless. So it is their saving grace. We also want to foster our children's um, strengths because when you're doing things something that you're good at, it's not so hard, okay? It's interesting and it means that it's much more likely they're going to succeed. Rather than trying to fight against, you know, um, the way that your brain's wired, it's like engaging and it's there. So as an example, my son really loves art. So we've been doing everything we can to upskill him doing art courses that we went from when we can afford it. He does animation and stuff because he wants to get into a course co called Graphic Media Art Design at Melville High School next year. Um, so when he goes into grade seven. But I know that if he doesn't get into something that fosters his strengths that he absolutely loves, high school is going to be hell for us because he's not naturally engaged and he struggles to you know, make himself do things he's not engaged in. But by fostering his strengths, I know that he's going to be with people that like the same, similar things to him, that he's doing things that, like if he's having trouble in, you know, say, spelling or math, there'll be something that he's good at that actually rewards him as well. So fostering their strengths is really important. We also need to upskill our kids. We need to teach them about their ADHD. And I know there's stigma out there, but I firmly believe the best way to fight stigma is not to give a damn about it. Because if you really own your disorder or whatever you've got going for you, you own it, you understand it, you know what's best for you, you stop caring what everybody else thinks. And that's really important. And so if we hide the diagnosis from our kids, we're basically telling them there's something wrong. It's like a bad thing to have, you know, you should be embarrassed about it and hide it. And that can't feel good. And you can't move into a place of self-acceptance and then self-compassion if you don't understand your disorder. 
And I think from a personal level, my whole life I tried to do things in which like I could get better, I could like stop making mistakes and I could start it da da And yet I did some wonderful things before I knew I had ADHD. I went to uni, became a nurse, didn't struggle at uni because I loved you know what I was doing. I had a really great career. I, you know, at one stage I ran a whole hospital overnight. I ran three departments. I was a wound care consultant, etc. But I still had struggles because, you know, I was good at the things where there was interest and not so good at the things that there wasn't, and you know, and stuff. But when I was trying to sort that stuff out without understanding I had ADHD, it was like part of the picture was missing. I was trying to work out how to navigate life using the roadmap that neurotypical people use and wonder why it didn't work for me. And so if we don't understand our disorder, then we don't get a chance to work out what do we need, which is probably going to be different to what someone else needs. Um, so it's really important and it's empowering to understand so you can accept, move on and work out how to best manage it. And um, as an example, I can understand that that can be really confronting. But it's no different that if you had a child who was in a wheelchair and say the child goes down, you know, you wheel them down the beach and they can see their friends running on the sand and things. And it can hurt a little bit that you're missing out. It's natural to go, oh, it hurts a little bit. But it doesn't mean the child in the wheelchair can't thrive. It means that how do we get them to thrive? How do we get to do the things that they're really good at, their strengths? And often, you know, they'll play Paralympic sport and they'll do, you know, you get a car now that you can drive if you're in a wheelchair, etc., etc. You do whatever you can to thrive. And it's the same with kids with ADHD or Tourette syndrome. It's like, yep, it might look a little bit different to, you know, what we probably originally hoped, but it doesn't mean it's a death sentence. It's working out, how do I be okay with this? And how do I live my best life regardless? With compassion, setting myself up for success instead of failure. Um, when we're upskilling our kids, it's a really good idea, good idea to think ahead, not just what does my child need now, but what are they going to need next year or the year after? So we can start teaching skills the earlier the better, because the more that we break them into manageable pieces, we're more likely to foster independence. So for example, my son is like, um, he's in year five, he's got year six and he'll be into year seven. When he goes to year seven, I know he's going to have to use a diary. At the moment, that is not going to happen. But if I, we bought a family diary this year that we put out, it's got seven days on it that you can see because I'm very much aware that with um, ADHD, you're time blind, it's either now or not now. And if I have something that says one day on it, it's like that's the only day it exists. But if I have a diary that has seven days and it's Monday and I can see Friday, Friday actually is this and the diary shows me that it's part of a month and part of a year. But by having a family diary and putting things in, so like I'm, I'm in... Um, I remember, I think I'm in, I'm in blue and Ian's in green and Jack's in red or something. We're colour coding it. Jack is visually seeing this diary and just getting used to the concept of using a diary without being responsible for it. So when we increase that, it's not like he's got to start from scratch, like, oh my God, there's a diary. It's almost like, well, a diary's kind of pretty cool. We're kind of already using one. And when I was talking about, you know, indirect teaching, this was a real... Um, un a celebration in our house. But one day Jack said to me, you know, I want to do this da-da-da-da-da. And I said, well, I think, mate, we need to write it on a post-it note because I've got really bad working memory um, and I just won't remember. So we wrote it down, we put a post-it note on the fridge. And we kept doing this for a little while. And one day I was washing the dishes and Jack said, oh, can we write a post-it note? And I said to Jack, hey, mate, how about you write the post-it note and stick it on the fridge? And from then on, post-it notes appear all the time in our house, every time Jack wants to, you know, to remember something. But he's learned a skill to actually support his executive functions without having any awareness that he has a problem. So it's not hurt his self-esteem in any way whatsoever. It's actually made him feel good about himself. So this is this indirect teaching thing of working out, you know, what kind of things will they need and how can we foster them without them knowing, I have to do this because I've got a problem and now you need to do this to fix it, which gives you that negative um, information about yourself. So how am I going for time? Do you want me to stop? I'll stop right now if you want me to. Um, well, just things about school.
Yeah, no, that's Sorry, that's not yeah, yeah, no, not a problem at all. Sorry, typical. No, I actually, usually I would go, yeah, it's my ADHD, I'm not really organised, but hey, every single other person has talked over as well, so I can't feel bad it was my ADHD. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak, and I hope you found that helpful. Thank you. And I, I really don't like asking people to stop because it is all so fabulous, the same with Dr Chang's. And um, there were so many gems in both those talks and um, I loved seeing the one where the child was being hijacked, what was the hijacked from um, the self-regulation, being in the moment and, and that, um, I can't remember now, my working memory's not there, it's late in the afternoon. Uh, that's right, I loved that one. And um, from my use it for good and not evil mantra I had in your one, my grandmother's one came back to me for that one, which I always remembered when my son was young, was your children leave, need your love the most when they least deserve it. So, <laughs> and that one, it's a good one.